Um, today's symposium is centered on the simple claim that architecture is always an economic matter. Whatever one's theoretical, ideological, political, artistic persuasions, there is no architecture without economy. To paraphrase one of our many problematic prime ministers, it's the start and end of everything. It's also the middle. It's fundamental to what we do, to the act of designing something. Um, now, before we get going, since my observations, and actually many of our participants are coming from, Lon from a London context, it's important, I think, to mention a couple of things up front quickly. Um, London's development sector was worth around 30 billion pounds a year pre-COVID. The scale and speed of this development has been quite unprecedented in recent years, and that figure takes a second to grasp. But for context, something like the, um, the King's Cross uh, redevelopment, sort of over here on the map, had a construction value of something like three billion pounds. So this 30 billion pounds per annum figure is made up of an enormous number of individual sites, all these red and pink dots, and some rather sizable projects that are kind of sort of reshaping city in significant ways. These blue areas are opportunity areas, which tend to contain several very, very large master plans each. Any urban historian will be able to tell you this is nothing new, especially in London. But the speed and the scale at the moment are quite striking and are connected to some overarching economic politics. The other thing I just wanted to mention up front is that this is a culture which has consequences, sometimes extremely positive, sometimes perhaps dubious in its claims, and sometimes troubling with real impacts on people's lives. So in a way, I wanted to just say this up front because this is the reality. And I think we're gonna talk about economy. This is always gonna be somehow in the back of our minds. Um, it's also, I think, important to remember the status of architects in this reality. Despite architecture journals publishing headlines like Architect X's controversial 20 million pound scheme granted permission, it's not exactly the architect's project. And it's quite unlikely that the architecture is exactly what's controversial about it. The architect likely didn't choose the site, set the brief or establish the business case that calls for a certain quantity. In a way they translated it into a built arrangement or perhaps elaborated built arrangements that inform those choices. As we all know, most architects benevolent claims or desires are at the mercy of the capital and will of others. As a profession, we are not totally in control of this situation, but we do have a responsibility within it. So nothing that I've just said absolves us of any complicity. This is of course quite a complicated thing. So the economy or the market is one part of this, the, the backdrop, let's say. But the use of the word economy today has a more immediate architectural applicability. I'd like to frame today's discussion more in terms of uh, economy of means in the context of the economy that we are subject to, but also the economy that we subject our work to. Navigating both determines the quality and realism of a work of architecture, and therefore its relevance and durability as such. So the notion of economy is proposed as a contextual, conceptual, operational, and ultimately architectural quality. As an introduction, I'm gonna to try to illustrate a very small cross-section of, I think not really a cross-section of this, but cross-section of my interpretation of this theme, I realize, which is not at all unbiased, what I'm gonna say next. Um, and some of it's a little bit contradictory, and some of it's a little bit provocative, uh, and some of it's obvious. Um, and I'm also gonna pose a few little questions in here, many of which I won't answer. A possible answer to the perennial questioning as to what exactly architecture is, was offered succinctly by Hannes Meyer in 1929. Architecture is organization. But in a way, I kind of suspect this has always been sort of known before and after. Somehow in receiving many of our ideas about architecture by art historical filters, some of the practical reality of the profession gets lost. The excitement of doing architecture, the job of it, as a cultural act gets replaced with a certain amount of superficiality. There's always a kind of skimming off and inflating of a thin layer of the profession. Superfluous and often self-gratifying mystification has a tendency to cloud the task. And the more we look at history as a series of hero stories, I think the more we think we're supposed to be mystifying and heroic. I'm of course totally aware of the irony of referencing Hannes Meyer here. 
Um, this sort of myth cultivation seems especially unproductive in the context of addressing certain ongoing things such as environmental or social issues or even some straightforward qualitative concerns. It's also perhaps a little bit denialist in the context of some contemporary professional conditions, such as um, fee undercutting, sometimes questionable added value tasks, acceptance of scope creep and unrealistic timeframes, all of which have become quite normalized in recent years. At the more conscious, conscious end of the professional spectrum, this situation tends to be addressed with, a, with complicated and often unnecessary conceptual rhetoric sometimes self-righteous moralism, and in some cases, the active reduction of architecture to a form of urban scale window dressing. What I'd like to pursue over the course of, I told you this wouldn't be unbiased by the way, sorry. <laughs> what I'd like to uh, pursue over the course of the day is the role of architecture, not as a slogan or image oriented commodity, but more in terms of its relationship to organization, arrangement and performance. This isn't to ignore aesthetic sensations, which are part of all of this, but in a way I'm more interested in asking what does it do, how much is required, where and how does one decide. So this is about reason and measure, give and take. To be more emphatic, I'd like to approach this from the, from the position of, of a profession concerned first of all with life, with pleasure in use, and with how to consciously use the resources available to us to support this. The term economy is useful here. It's kind of etymological origins uh, are rooted in household management, but also the management of material resource. Both of these are clearly architectural concerns, the organization of spaces for life and the organization of material processes. The art is in the practice as much as the product. Let's start with practice itself. How to run and sustain an office, to pay staff, creditors, resources, rent. We have to organize the workings of a practice, the way we work and approach work, who does what, how much time can be spent. And we have to continuously win new work. This takes an enormous amount of time and effort with a mixed success rate. The various modes of procurement come with various levels of risk and reward and various levels of built-in compromise and various impacts on a practice during the, bid the bidding process. At what point does this become a false economy? How does one balance this ecosystem? This is linked to how we design. How much energy is exerted in the design process? Where does it go? How much complexity is really necessary in architectural design, given the complexity of the content and often the complexity of the context? How does one sustain conceptual clarity from strategy to detail? How much design is really needed? How much needs to be drawn? How much needs to be said? It's easier, easier, even quicker, once you have the habit to say, in my opinion, it is not an unjustifiable assumption that than to say, I think. Um, I like this quote a lot, but it's also not so easy when you have a, you come from a place which has an economy of pronunciation. Um, the philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein went further some 20 years earlier with the provocation, what can be said at all can be said clearly. What we cannot talk about we must pass over in silence. Clarity and precision and an openness to the interpretation of others. These, of course, sound like contradictions, but I'd argue they're sort of fundamental to architecture, to a public practice. It applies to how we design as much as how we talk, write and draw. Where is value located? What is there to gain? I'm sure most people listening are um, fully aware of Lacaton and Vassal's position on this, to carefully manage cost and substance in favour of more space, more potential. This word potential will pop up a few times, I think. Meanwhile, in the UK, for various reasons, value tends to be located here. Many of those watching will have come across things such as a 10% articulation allowance built into cost plans. I think it's, it's important to understand that this is actually part of a, a total kind of cultural product of our times in the UK. It's connected to a, a sort of culture of um, assumed complexity, an idea that a certain level of complexity is required a priori, that complexity in itself perhaps demonstrates care, quality, value, skill, maybe even intelligence. It's also connected to the way project costing and budgeting unfolds. In some instances, you 
could imagine that if we started from an economically uh, clear idea like Lacaton and Vassell, um, that there'd be perhaps little left at the end of the various compulsory value engineering uh, stages. Or at least that's a fear, so it's not very often tried. It's an architecture indebted to the emphasis placed on visual articulation by the planning system as a means for safeguarding quality. It's interesting, of course, to think about how these buildings are made. And very few of them look like how they're built or built or built like how they look. Which in itself exposes some, let's say, um, gaps between the image of building targeted at the planning system, developers preferred procurement routes and the way contact contractors actually build. Hans Kohlhoff, of course, had some interesting thoughts on this in his essay on uh, tectonics of perceived construction, although I doubt he's worked in similar circumstances for some time. There's a lot to be said regarding the economics of construction, the rationale for this or that construction method, the relationship between method and material, preferred supply chains, the range of trades involved, inherent process waste or embedded carbon. Who is building it? What are their skills, their wage? How much of the on-site processes are building or assembly? How much construction happens off-site? How many steps are there in the process? Where do the materials come from? Where does the labor come from? Can we still conceptualize construction? Can we design the building process? And can we design in a lean way, like this example? Can we ever get close to this level of intentionality with a design and build contract? Are we well enough attuned to the realities of the construction industry? Of course, an image like this looks fairly romantic now, but perhaps there's still some scope for designing by thinking of the making, as the Smithsons put it. Many architects have explored the, the possibilities of a conscious simplification of, the, of construction as both a financial and architectural idea, just something that he will touch on later. Is the distance between architect and building too great today? Or do we just have to be more pragmatic, perhaps more collagist? Material economy is more than cheapness. What is the scope for reuse or recycling? Not only specifying recycled materials or simply noting their reusability, but developing tangible deliverable strategies for the future reuse or deconstruction of a building we design. This is a study um, by Rota, actually by their students at TU Delft, analyzing the projected reusability of components in an OMA project uh, recently built in Rotterdam. Time is a key economic consideration, often with a tension between long-term value and short-term wins. A decade after this well-documented Lacaton and Vassal project in Paris, the call to retrofit first is gaining traction. It's of course subject to tax implications. We also need to ask if our new buildings will be capable of multiple lives. Will a housing scheme built in 2021 uh, withstand conversion to another use in 2051? One has certain doubts about this. Should indeterminacy in new buildings not be on the agenda too? Recycling is of course inherent to the design process. This example by OMA of upscaling an unbuilt house design as the basis for Casa de Musica is well known, of course also slightly cliche now. But copying, recycling and modifying previous designs has a long history. The same economy is present in vernacular construction, pattern books or resources such as Durand's collections. Ron Koolhaas himself recognised the reciprocity between convention and conceptual economy long before Casa de Musica. For me, it's important to invest your energy precisely and only in the part of the compositional process, even if it's only a small part that needs to be original. Everything else that doesn't have to be original, I can borrow from the world around me. One can wonder about words like original, of course, but OMA has been instrumental in thinking about how to mobilise reality and economic reality in particular as architectural substance. Certainly, as you'll have guessed, probably instrumental in my thinking about it. Sometimes positive, sometimes questionable and often upsetting the architecture profession's self-image. But the impacts are tangible and many of the strategies are extremely useful. Even a statement as flippant as no money, no details, just concepts. Again, not always positive, but one of the striking qualities of this attitude is its similarity in many ways to Mies' attitude, albeit cheaper, 
one of the things is that you know spatial situations and the quality of material extents even very pragmatic ones gain a, a special significance what becomes clear is an interest in the ratio of typical to specific or the special and the sensible as we talk about often at east and the role of strategies or rules in investing meager substance with intentions investing them with conceptual clarity as part of a whole Simple rules can be a dense compound of ideas. Rules are a cultural construct in themselves. I, mean, I could also cite almost any form of music or something like the writing of Georges Perec, kind of dialectic between control and possibility. Defining rules is a, is a design activity and accepting rules is also a design activity. Rules don't necessarily preclude invention. Certain rules can stimulate or sharpen creative responses. Their negotiation can invest the work with character. Embracing certain parameters and limitations as context when they make sense allows energy to be focused more precisely. The capacity to accept, um, to demonstrate a certain neutrality perhaps, is a legitimate spatial quality too. American architecture has a long history of strategically balancing neutrality and intensity, perhaps even a certain amount of hedonism and neutrality. How much urban and programmatic potential can be built into a single plot, a single building? The skill and lack of angst visible in the best examples of this is quite brilliant, in my opinion. <laughs> During the 19th and 20th century, it seems like North American architects had a special kind of ease with the world they were working in and a special kind of competence in translating that reality into architecture straightforwardness and pragmatism, sometimes achieving amazing results, calm and monumental. This is an urban idea, of course. Pierre Vittorio Arelli wrote a, a very nice text, this one down here, um, describing the uh, interdependence between Hawksmoor's churches and the general calm, repetitive urban fabric of Georgian London, the relationship between the exception and the rule, the monumental and the even covered field. <laughs> Also an architectural idea and an, an, sorry, an economic strategy for focusing intentions or locating value operable at many scales repetition and difference repetition is an economic strategy par excellence it also proves divisive in both popular and architectural discourse sometimes stoking rather reactionary opposition but repetition is a quality and a quality with political implications, as the Smithsons noted. It would seem that one of the things that is crucial to the long use of an idea in architecture, and to repetition in particular, is a special sort of anonymity of styling, and this is an important and civilising realisation. This is from a really brilliant book with a really brilliant title, Without Rhetoric. I think there's lots to be learned from that. And repetition is a recurring theme in it across many scales. Alison and Peter Smithson, of course, have also contributed uh, a lot to the conceptualization of economy, starting with their desire in the, in the 1950s to make an architecture for a society that had nothing, through the idea of as found, to the relationship between form, language and quietness in work around the period of this book. Repetition is often considered in opposition to difference. It's curious that certain kinds of neutrality support variety whilst others are perceived to homogenize. Although experiencing LA on the ground is quite a bit richer than this image on the left would suggest. And that richness has perhaps more to do with what's allowed to happen in this landscape than what's been designed. In some ways, urban management is more instrumental than urban design in determining the value of space, the value of land, of extents, relationships and potentials. That way. Whereas design, in some instances, suggests a drive towards finality or completeness, good management is attentive. It's a life process that balances structure with an ability to accommodate. It can, of course, also make very assertive decisions, like Alvaro Caesar's example here on the right hand side. My provocation would be that architecture is no different that our ability to locate value requires a, re a reduction in self-consciousness and a sharpening, sharpening of strategic faculties. The ability to be economical in the original sense, 
to be pragmatic in the pursuit of lived pleasures. And so maybe a few questions that I would like to put forward for the discussion later. How much architecture is necessary and what does it do? Are its virtues experienced or consumed? Does it provide a setting for life or a substitute for it? And so I'm back with where I started now with architecture as a profession that deals with life. Um, and I'm going to finish here, you'll be glad to hear. This is a quote from uh, Desmet Vermeulen, and I'm extremely happy that Paul has joined us today. And this quote, uh, I sent this round to all of the participants to invite them to today's discussion. And it sums up much more concisely than I've just said, I think, the agenda for the day in my eyes. Isn't architecture essentially a question of economy? Isn't the art of it to draw abundance from scarce resources? An economic work has to be able to withstand rapid consumption. It should not be exhausted in a trice, but should gather up the dividend of time. Added value arises from concentration. The things that come into our care are in themselves not up, up to much, but added together, the whole is worth more than the parts. Nothing serves one single purpose, and we make grateful use of what already exists. In this way, we can satisfy the, the, all of the desires that are worth considering, because asceticism, another word that's difficult to say with a Leicester accent, Voluntarily renouncing our desires may be noble, but it's not our cup of tea.